Yeah, I'm waiting for that big. There's always going to be a, like big backlash article where where then everybody's like, "Yeah, that's what I really thought." You know, it's that's I'm always waiting for that. Uh, I remember it happened with uh, Chris Ware's Rusty Brown. You know, it was clearly like a beyond a masterpiece, and everybody, all the reviews were great. And then this one guy was like, "Actually, this thing sucks." And then all these people came out like, "I agree." And it, so you always, you know, there's always that, but. Uh, but yeah, I, I've been, uh, I had no idea what the response would be. I thought, uh, I thought a certain amount of people would love it. Like that would really, really love it. And then I didn't know what like the rest of, and I knew some people would hate it, but I, the, like the vast middle, I had no, which way, no idea which way they'd go. So, um, yeah, it's very rewarding to see. Just see people enjoy it. That's all I wanted. Have you seen any of the negative reviews yet? Or it seems like you've been blissfully ignorant. Not really? Yeah, no, not really. I, and I, I never read any of them, good or bad, except to I sort of skim to see like what the gist is. But I, I find it, uh, I just find it really boring <laughs> to read about my own book. Like, I don't know. It's just like, it doesn't hold my interest somehow. Even... You know, years later, sometimes it's really interesting to go back and go and like when I'm not so in the thick of the book. But right now I'm just all I think about is uh, people's response to the book. And it gets uh, it's it's uh, sort of stultifying in a way. It's just uh, it's you know, I'm just I'm happy to see like, oh, they liked it. And that's that's all. I get out of it. You're mentioning the backlash and, and it's this funny thing. Like I've experienced this on a personal level. I don't know if you have too, but you really enjoy a thing and then you, you read a critique of it and that person maybe makes a little bit of a point and suddenly it starts unraveling for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's human nature. You know, you can always, one thing I love to do is to read, um, read like one star reviews of like the death of Ivan Illich or Moby Dick. Or something like because because they're very similar to all negative reviews. I always find those kind of reviews always almost always use the phrase "the emperor's new clothes." You know, it's sort of people are saying this is a great book, but obviously I'm I'm smarter than they are, and I can see that it's just a it's just a scam. And I always I love that. I love that uh, there's not a there's not a work of art in the world that doesn't have somebody who just thinks it's terrible, you know, one star. You probably also have this impulse as I do of just that thing. I mean, I've gotten better with it about it with age, you know, it's it's kind of like a bit of a teen angst holdover, but of, Oh, this thing is super popular right now. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to like it because everybody else likes it. Of course that was, that's my entire personality, but that made a lot of sense when I was growing up, you know, in the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, the stuff that was really popular really was kind of awful. And the, and the hidden stuff was so hidden, you know, it was just, there was no way to know about it. And it felt like this very specialized knowledge. And once you learned about these really cool things that other people weren't seeing, you know, like John Waters movies or Eraserhead or something like that, uh, they were so much more uh, powerful and, and meaningful and emotional than, uh, uh, whatever mainstream movies were playing Tootsie or whatever, you know, just, it was such a, uh, such a different, uh, a different world. Now, now everything's sort of equally available. You know, everybody can find out about everything. You know, there's, I've had artists that I've never heard of. And all of a sudden by the end of one day, I know everything about them, seen everything they've ever published. And then three days later, I forget all about it. You know, it just didn't, doesn't stick at all. I was reading the piece you did with Francois for The New Yorker, and you mentioned a Time Magazine book from, I want to say, like the, fi- the mid-50s called The World We Live In, uh, uh, like basically about the formation of the Earth. So, so I, you know, yes. I did, I, yeah. they, there's a link in the story, and I clicked on the link, and I went, and, and it brings you an Amazon page. And there, there's no information because, you know, it's a, it's a very old book that's been out of print for probably most of that time. But then you look you scroll down to the bottom and there's a, a people who buy this book also buy and it's your book. Uh-huh. It, it's just the algorithm, you know, it's somebody, uh, somebody read that article and went and bought Monica and oh, I'm going to get this, you know, who knows? 
or they're rebuying it from their youth. Yeah, there, it's always everything comes together in a weird way like that. It's always fascinating. The thing that I really appreciated about that that piece specifically is, and I don't know if you've done this before, or at least not to this degree, but of really like going through and picking apart the influences in the book and kind of bearing it all out. Is that a new process for you? I mean, I could do it for every book. It was interesting. Originally, she wanted to reprint one of the stories from the book. And I really didn't, I didn't want anything to be available while, you know, before it was out. You and I talked about what well talked before it came out. out, you know, you were very cautious about spoilers. I really wanted uh, people to have no idea what it was, just so there's a blue girl on the cover. Let's see what, you know, what happens. And, um, and so I really didn't want to do that. And so she, Francoise is very brilliant. She came up with that idea of, well, let's talk about your influences. And, and I could have done it for every single panel in the book if I wanted to. I just, I, I picked like 20 panels and she pared it down to whatever there were, eight or nine. It was very funny. I was interviewing her and, or she was interviewing me and, uh, and we were talking about that Bernard Krigstein character, you know, who's sort of the artist who uh, who's was in an old, uh, th- what is it? He did EC Comics? No, he did EC Comics, but he, he, he that was the la- very last comic that uh, Bernard Krigstein did was the 13th Precinct. It was like a Dell comic, and it had this ridiculous artist character who felt very autobiographical to Christine and himself, sort of like a self mockery. And so I, I always loved that. And I love that he just ended there. You, most artists, you don't quite know the end of their career. They do stuff that you don't see, but that was it. He was done. And so I wanted to take that character and bring him into my story. So I'm sort of, you know, almost doing a, you know, a follow up to the same character, like a, like one artist taking over a, daily strip for another artist. But so I was talking about Bernard Krigstein and how he had done an interview in a fanzine called Squatrant a million years ago. That was very informative to me as a, as a young artist. It was the first time I read somebody talking about comics as something more than just, you know, pop entertainment for kids. He really had lofty ambitions and ideas that were absolutely thwarted. And so he, never did them. But I took that as like, Oh my God, here's a, here's a world that I could explore that hasn't really been done yet. Um, And so I, I was talking to Francoise about it and I said something about this great interview with him. And then, uh, and then I remembered, Oh, it was Art Spiegelman as a kid did the interview and we had a question about it and she was just like, Hey Art, can you come here? And he just comes over barely even says hi to me. He's just like, yeah, well, you know, we did that when we went to Krigstein's studio, we did this and John Benson, you know, was the guy who asked the question and all that, but it was just so funny. To, it was like the uh, Marshall McLuhan moment in Annie Hall. What's funny about specifically about putting that, that story together is not wanting to reveal too much about the book ahead of time, but but you're also reviewing a ton about the book ahead of time. You know, I, I did not intend for that piece to come out so far in advance. I thought it was going to come out kind of the week of the book. And I, I, I was hoping people would, um, would just read the book and then go back to that, which it seems like everybody I know did do that. You know, they started to read it and they went, Oh, wait, I don't want to, I don't want to see it. So yeah, it's, that's the trouble with all, modern promotion. Everybody wants to be first. Everybody wants, I'm the one who showed this first. Everybody who gets the book takes all the, all the most like pivotal panels and posts them on Instagram. And so it's like, you know, just human nature to want to like uh, ruin everything (laughs) to be, to be, you know, to be like, I was first to show that panel or something. It's very, uh, it's frustrating, but I, you know, I should have anticipated it. We're in a different world than we used to be. It used to be so strict about like, you can't show anything in a magazine review without approval. And that's just all out the window. There's like videos online of people reading the book page by page, which is just insane. You know, that's just literally like 
scanning it and and giving it out for free you know the last time we we spoke again well in advance of of the book coming out um i I told you that it's one of those books where when you finish it you know you 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 want to go back because it it's so it's so dense and i think you, you had said at the time that basically everybody had also told you something along those lines yeah this this might be a musician thing, and you know, certainly like a lot of the musicians I talk to, uh, to have have this thing about you know wanting the art to speak for itself. But it is such a dense book that you seem okay really taking the time and talking not so much about what the book is about, but about your intentions. Yeah, I mean i I don't feel great doing it. I try to be. I try, it is somebody the other night. I did a talk the other night, and a friend of mine went. And they said, well, you've really developed a, a skill of being both very honest and not revealing anything too important. And that that's what I'm trying to do. It's hard. It's hard. But I have I have all kinds of different ideas about the book. And so sometimes I may talk about one idea and then people assume that's sort of the, the correct way to go in interpreting the book. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just one direction that all of a sudden is interesting to me. So I I don't want to inflect anybody. Everything that's in the book is, is there for a reason. There's nothing that you need to know outside of the book to, to get it or to make sense of it. And really anything I might say outside of the book is probably going to diminish it. So I would take anything I say with a grain of salt, um, it's uh i'm tempted to just uh say very different things in every single interview because they can basically be all true and and i think it it's it's a better idea to be um to kind of obscure any intentions i have rather than clarifying them i i tempted to do sort of an andy warhol thing sometimes where you just have just make everything up i've done that in interviews just completely made up just to see if anybody believed it to see what your wikipedia page looks like the next day yeah yeah you effectively said that there's a sense in which your mother passing um was was a relief because you were saving her a heartbreak but but you still i mean you knew going into it that you were going to be having these sorts of conversations and you knew that you were going to talk about these deeply deeply personal things what is that process been like for the last few months yeah it's very strange i don't really like to talk about personal things in public but in in the way that i think it informs the book i feel like it's it's uh you know i have to speak honestly i don't i've never been able to to do interviews where i'm just sort of obfuscating the whole time or or dancing around things it's a I appreciate other artists who are, who are honest in interviews, who are, um, you know, kind of talk about the painful elements in their work. So, you know, I try to, I try to live up to that a little bit, but, you know, I have like very mixed feelings about my mother and it's hard to, hard to express that in a, in just a few sentences, you know, it's, it's a, it's a novel's worth of, complications and it's i don't want to pare it down to she was this and that and my childhood was this and that because it's it's really really much denser than that and that's what i hope the book kind of implies you know that it's not it's not simplified it's actually it's actually presenting something that feels dense and complicated what a strange (laughs) did it feel like a strange life at the time no, no, it never does. I, I don't, I remember like, I remember being like 15 and, and walking with my mom and her boyfriend and my brother and my brother's girlfriend. And we were just walking by, by a record store that had kind of mirrored windows. And I remember seeing my family and just thinking like, oh, my family's like the Munsters. Like that was my first thought or like the Adams family. Like they were just such a bunch of weirdos. And like, you know, like when I was a kid, all my, all my, like I would tell, uh, I'd go over to a kid's house and I'd think, oh, who's your mom? You know, who's, cause everybody knew each other in the neighborhood and I would say who my mom was and they would be like, oh my God, you know, 
like they'd either want to like protect me or like you could move in with us, you know, or they'd, or they'd be really disdainful. Like, Oh God, she's the worst, you know? And it was just, it was like such a weird feeling. And I, I could tell other kids, parents told them like, don't hang out with him. His mom is really fucked up. <laughs> you know? And, and so, uh, so it just, I was always very, uh, like felt like I was, had to be very defensive as a kid. The mirror story is very funny because there's a few panels from eight ball that have just really stuck with me over the years. And one of the main ones is the narrator passing a window and seeing his own reflection and shrieking. (laughs) Haven't we all had that? Yeah. I just, I used to go for a morning walk, like to get my coffee and I'd always think, like, oh, I look fine. You know, I'd sort of squint at myself in a foggy mirror. And then I'd be walking out in the street and I'd look at, look at, you know, some reflection and my hair would be sticking up and I had like a five o'clock shadow. And I did my first thought was like, oh, there's some homeless, you know, guy teetering out of the, out of the, you know, bar that opens at 10 a.m. down the street. And then, oh, wait, it's just me. <laughs> you know, we were talking about the idea of a parodic self insert. And that was very much a, common theme in a lot of the eight ball strips sure i mean i'm an, an artist is his own best material you know there's always that yeah i never trust an artist who who only wants to make themselves look good it's often in a subtle way or it's with it's it's in that humble brag kind of way where it's sort of fakely self-deprecating but not and i i always admire anybody who makes themselves look terrible like uh like Joe Matz, the perfect example, his entire body of work. He he exaggerated how awful he was. Crumb, Crumb does that too. Crumb makes himself much more horrible than I've ever seen him be in person. You know, it's it's, uh, and I think that's how he feels. It's also it's also a characteristic, and I have this a little bit too, where you're uncomfortable if people like you too much. If you know, once once everybody loves something, it, it my I feel like that's not something I'm comfortable with being, being embraced like that. So you want to do something that kind of scares everybody away or, or pushes them off or, or, uh, or challenges them. Oh, if you love me for that, how about for this? You know, it's, and I can see that in a lot of artists. Certainly comics is, is, is the medium for self deprecation. And, jo- you know, Joe, I mean, you know, speaking of people who, who passed recently, I, yeah since the last time we talked. uh, Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think you're right, but I also, you know, I knew him a little bit and knowing what I know about Joe, I I think he also kind of embraced the idea of being a cartoon character. I think, I think he leaned into it and I don't know how much it was an exaggeration for him in the end. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, he was, he was very much the way he depicted himself. He was, all the stuff about like cheapness and all that, absolutely, exactly true. I I used to, th- when I would, you know, hang out with them and he would, you know, make us go to a really cheap restaurant because he knew I was going to pay for him. And so he had to figure, you know, stuff like that. And I'd be like, are you just doing this to like live up to your cartoon image? Or is this like, are you impelled to do this? And I realized like, no, it was, that's who he was. But I do think he, he he made himself look uh sort of harsher than he really was he was not a he wasn't a mean guy at all you know he wasn't he he comes off as a little cruel in the comics and he was really just incredibly kind guy and everybody you know you could read his comics maybe and go like oh this guy's horrible and then you'd meet him and in 10 minutes you'd be like i love this guy like he's just you know somebody you want to hang out with i was i was going to see him in uh you know two weeks when i'm down there for la i was i was going to his favorite bookstore skylight and i thought oh that'll be so fun to see joe and i knew he'd have a he'd have such an interesting take on this book unlike anybody else you know he would he would often you know be the one guy who'd be like you know i don't like this one part something that nobody's ever mentioned you know he would he would focus on and it would be so interesting so i'm i'm really sad to miss that among many other things. One of the things that you said to me that stuck with me, you know, we were talking about Richard Sala and I got the sense that, 
you know, one of your earlier reactions was like, you know, he's never going to be able to read this book and he's never going to be that incredibly important sounding board that I've had all these years. I mean, as you get older, you realize those people who have these kind of wonderful responses, you know, that have these have, have like a lifetime of, of reading the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, kind of plays into a book like this and understand it on such a profound level. Those people are not, not infinite. You know, there, once one disappears, no, there's not a new Richard to take his place. There's never going to be another person like that. And, and, you know, you, you really feel that loss, even just in, in terms of that tiny aspect of the relationship, um, you know, it's, it's, it makes the response to a book like this totally diminish not to have, you know, him and Gary Lieb and some of my other friends. Do you, you still have those people in your life though, who you, I mean, do you, do you show the book to anybody but your editor? Um, no, nobody, nobody reads it till it's completely, till I feel like it's completely done. Then I let my wife read it and she, um, she'll tell me if something is unclear or she'll find a trillion spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes. And, um, and so I'll correct those. And then it's only after that, that I let my editor read it. I let one friend read it before the editor did this time, but usually Eric Reynolds is, is the second or third person. And then I go from there, you know, he, I don't, I'm not sure he's ever had a, a comment of something to change. He'll, he'll notice things, especially in the coloring. He'll notice like, oh, you colored this guy's pants two different colors or something like that. Um, but it's usually very minute. Um, by the by, the time anybody reads it, it's almost unchangeable. You know, even if somebody really didn't like it, I, I doubt I would change it for that reason. You know, it just it would it would be too indelible at that point. That's a long relationship with Eric. So, you know, he, he must be doing something right. Years. Well, he's such a, uh, he, he just loves comics so much and like, and, um, and has such a joy in reading it. And, and like, it's genuine, you know, you can tell when people are like, that's their job and they read it and, and they're happy to publish it and they're, it's going to sell a lot, you know, but Eric is much more. Like, even if Fanographics didn't publish the book, he, he'd be the, like, the main guy to comment on whatever I'm doing. And, uh, you know, he's just such a, such a great guy, great friend. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's such a joy to work with somebody you're that close to, you know, on, on a level like this. Usually, uh, like your, publisher or, you know whoever you're working with like a producer in movies or something is somebody you're you're you get along with but you're not super close to and you know often that's better for a financial relationship but in this case it's just uh it's i wouldn't trade it for anything at this point i get the sense you know looking at the the movies that you've worked on over the years that maybe you're a little bit spoiled with that relationship with terry Oh, totally. Nobody ever gets that. Nobody will ever have that again. <laughs> you know, for a writer to, on their very first movie, get to like be on the set and make comments and, and you know, sort of have have some semblance of control and have his ideas taken seriously. That's, I just thought like, well, of course, that's how people work. It makes sense. That's how it works in the theater, you know, writer a director, you don't even know their name most of the time. And a writer comes in and is like, chop this line, move this over here. You know, it's, they have much more power. So it made a lot of sense to me just sort of knowing about that kind of world. And, uh, but it's, it's just impossibly rare. You know, most directors just don't even want you to see it till the film's all done. Which is like you with your books. Of course. Yeah. No, I, I don't really, I don't have any like disrespect for that or anything. I just, uh, I, I, I just realized how fortunate I was to not be treated that way. Both of those movies were, were very collaborative. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, our, on Ghost World, our costume, uh, designer, Mary Zofries 
probably the biggest costume designer in America. Um, she had worked with the Cone Brothers before that, and she was like, "You guys work just like the Cone Brother." <laughs> you know, it was very similar to that. Where that's a nice uh, thing to hear. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I took that in the best sense of the word, and I'm not sure she meant like the quality is <laughs> the same, but but it, she meant it in just in the way. Like they're, they're sort of off by themselves, kind of joking with each other. You know, and she described they had this very private brotherly relationship. And I think Terry and I were a bit like that because we were so intimidated by all the professionals around us. You know, we didn't know how to, how to, uh, you know, deal with people who were like really good at their jobs and had done it a million times. You know, you get, when you work on a movie like that, you get the sense of, uh, like, why am I making this? You know, Terry, Terry would be like, all these people know, you know, know so much more about movies and how they're made than I do. But, you know, then you realize it's all the, it's all the like sensibility you bring to it. You have to, you just have to be very, uh, adamant about getting your, your vision across. That's, that's sort of the main skill, I think, of being a director. It didn't dawn on me until you said that, but I, I guess. Ghost World was kind of his first narrative movie. It was all documentaries up to that point. Though, though his documentaries are largely, uh, you know, set up. <laughs> well, for <laughs> sure, but but not not the same kind of orchestration no, required to make. No, a movie but like in, that. in many ways, he would get like he would tell Crumb, you know, go go sit at the bus stop, pretend to do this. Now draw on your sketchbook. You know, it was very directed. So uh, so you know, he was sort of working with amateur actors in a way on his documentaries, and so he. Uh, he he had a great gift for it you know he he uh he knew what made him laugh and he knew not to get like uh overwhelmed by the situation where you start to think like well maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe uh maybe this isn't funny or maybe if i do this an audience will find it funny even though i don't find it funny he knew to like only make it for himself and and that- the crumb documentary in particular and talk about putting yourself in scenarios where you can get overwhelmed his brothers i yeah no that and he had to cut out all kinds of even more <laughs> incredible stuff that could have been a nine-hour film i know you've spoken about this before and i, I know that that wilson was a very different experience maybe, maybe almost like a 180 from what you had with with terry um was it was it was it difficult enough that it kind of just put you off of wanting to make movies for a while? No, no. I mean, it, you know, it just was, it, it didn't feel like my film. I didn't have any, I, I wrote a script that was somewhat followed and, but the actors were allowed such liberties with ad libs and things that by the end, I almost felt like there wasn't a single line of dialogue that I actually wrote. And there were scenes that were kind of pieced together in the editing that I didn't write. And, and, you know, by the time I saw it, I just didn't feel that much connection to it. I I loved a lot of the people involved in it, but, uh, but it just didn't, it wasn't, it just wasn't anything I, I felt like uh, connected to, but that's what happens. You know, at this point, I really only want, like film directors who, who I think of as like as good as or better artists than I am to just take it and do their thing. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to like be involved really. It's just not that fun. My dream for all my books is that they'd be made in, in like, you know, like South Korea, Taiwan, Romania, you know, made by these, in these countries where there's this wonderful film culture where they make these very specific kinds of films and they would just use little bits and pieces of it or something and turn it into something else. That's, that's the, those are the films I'd most want to see. You want Italian Spider-Man, but for. Kind of like patience, I think would be great as, as like a crazy South Korean sci-fi film, you know, just that, that sensibility. So great, you know, Bong Joon Ho or something like that. It wouldn't work as an American, a straightforward American sci-fi. It would be missing the point. Yeah, you know, there's people who could do it, but uh, the trouble is, all the all the great American directors, especially, write their own stuff. They have their own thing, you know. Scorsese's not maybe 
the one guy who's still adapting stuff, but every, most of the others, they have their own ideas, you know, which that's how I am too. I'm not, I'm not looking to adapt anybody's uh, movies into comics. You said something in one of the interviews that I was reading and it reminded me of that Scorsese quote from, you know, four or five months ago where he was talking about seeing uh, uh, Kurosawa um, accept like a lifetime achievement award. And um, Kurosawa said something along the lines of, um, you know, now that I understand what movies can be, it's, it's too late. Um, Scorsese's 80, you know, he's got this movie coming out and, and it looks fantastic and he's very rarely missed. Right now I'm like caring for my wife's in-laws who are 80 and they're barely able to, you know, leave the house. And the thought of making, making like what sounds like a masterpiece at 80 is so, so incredible to me. I mean, I just can't even believe his energy. His version of that quote was like, I'm old, I want to tell stories, but there's no time left, which, you know, that it sticks with you, obviously. And it's for a number of reasons. One of, you know, that, are you telling me that you, that your other masterpieces weren't, (laughs) you know, that, that you didn't, that you didn't hit that height that you're hoping to, but also obviously the, the mortality aspect. And, you know, and I, I talk to artists about this all the time and there's something about cartoonists. I think one is just the, um, kind of the personality that, that draws people to make in comics, but, but also the, the length of time that it takes to make a book. I mean, this is something that you were working on since before Trump was elected. Or at least, at least thinking about. Yeah. You know, to make books the way I want to make them takes a long time. Uh, I wish it didn't, but I love it. I love the way I do it, you know, I love being in that process. So I don't necessarily want to change anything, but, um, but yeah, you, you feel the years pile up. You know, I, I, uh, once I turned 60, I, I went on uh, Wikipedia and just looked up every artist that I love to see what they were doing at 60. And it's, it wasn't a pretty picture, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, some of them just getting started, you know, going strong. Some of them totally done for 20 or more years. Um, and a lot of them really kind of, you know, running out of steam. And so I really wanted to, I mean, that was partly what I was thinking with Monica is I want to, I want to do, do what I can do at, at sort of the height of my powers while I, while I still have them. Cause you never know, you know, it's very, you get arthritis one day and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I'm, I can't draw. I'm going to draw with my left hand or whatever, you know. Um, so right now, while everything's going strong, I really want to try to do as much as I can. I have, uh, you know, I have some ideas for, for another book. I'm hoping it won't be seven years because that's, uh, I'm getting, getting, uh, into, you know, AARP years, you know, once I get to that point. But right now I feel, you know, I still feel, quite young artistically you know and you develop this kind of body of knowledge and sort of awareness of human nature and things like that that are um that you don't have when you're younger so you really do have this kind of much bigger skill set so i think the one thing you lose is uh is it's very hard to do anything that's not not like your best work, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go backwards and start doing stuff. That's like, well, I can, you know, I could do a pretty good book. You don't want to do that. So it's hard to, uh, it's hard to keep moving upwards. Yeah. That's probably a big part of the reason why the process is so long is, you know, you are, I assume thinking of and rejecting a lot of ideas that feel like they'd be a step down. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, I mean, I sort of admire artists who kind of just do the same thing over and over and they, and they don't worry about like, like doing something new or challenging themselves or anything. They just take great pleasure in doing their thing. But I've never, I've never been interested in that really. I've never been able to do that. I, uh, 
I'm always uh, looking at, as I'm drawing, I'm looking and I'm thinking, you know, could I have drawn this when I was 30, you know, or 40? Like, is this markedly different? And, uh, and trying to be aware of like, what have I learned since then? And it's all, it's maybe things only I can see, but there's, it's hugely different to me. Like I know, I feel like a lot of stuff when I was younger, I was sort of faking. I was sort of like, I know how to draw like a comic book, you know, eyes and, and eyebrows and I can make them look sort of uh, like they're, you know, like they're legitimate. And now it's like, no, I really know what an eye looks like. And I'm drawing an actual eye, not a comic book facsimile of an eye. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I, cause I had taken that as, just storytelling, but it sounds like it really applies to all level of the process for you. Yeah. Yeah. I try to, I try to sort of go through a cycle of, of like keeping up my, my learning on, you know, in each department. So I'll, I'll go through a phase where I'm just really getting into figure drawing and I'll just do sketch pads full, full of figure drawings and, um, and, you know, drawing like clothing folds, you know, you have to like, relearn the the math behind that over and over it's very complicated um and then i'll and then i'll read you know authors talking about writing fiction or writing plays or something like that and focus on that for a while and look at uh look at paintings for examples for color you know things like that so i'm always trying to trying to like keep keep the knowledge alive often just often just revisiting the same things i've looked at since I was in art school, you know, I have some of the same textbooks I look at over and over just to try to like, remember how to do things. That kind of thing causes you to at least understand the whole Daniel Day Lewis thing of, you know, working on the Phantom Thread and then quitting acting to become a cobbler. Sure. Stuff like that is very helpful. I've been, uh, I've been painting since I stopped doing Monica for the first time since I was 18 years old, since I was in art school. And I'm, it, as I, my painting teacher, who's an old friend, she, uh, she said, like, you're coming into this where you, there's like, you know, 11 things you need to learn as a painter. And you know how to do 10 of them because there are things I do, composition, color, you know, things like that, that I sort of understand. But the actual painting technique is something you have zero idea what you're doing. And so it's, it's weird to sort of like, I can, I can do some of the aspects of painting, but just the actual, like applying a brush is I'm completely unskilled so far. And so it's really, it's really interesting to kind of see that, you know, you kind of see where your talent will take you in a different field. And so it's super fun and, and challenging. And I don't feel any pressure because I'm like, I'm not a painter. You know, I'm just, this is just a hobby. It's like doing ceramics or something. So you will never show it to people. Oh, sure. Sure. Someday. If I do a good one, forgive me. Cause I, I think we've probably talked about this before, but w when you went to art school, did you imagine yourself becoming a painter? Uh, no, never. I, I, I never, you know, as a kid, uh, I had friends who went to like painting lessons after school or took, we, we just didn't have any art programs in my high school for some reason. And so I just never learned any of it. And I had never, I just didn't get it. You know, I didn't get how it was done. And when I went to art school, you had to take uh, painting. And I remember like at the very end, I started to get it. I was like, oh yeah, not like I get how to do it. And it, I did a couple paintings that I still look at and I'm like, oh, these are kind of cool. And then, but then I just didn't pursue it because that was, it was kind of a different major. I was, I was in drawing and illustration and that was mostly all just line art, black and white. Um, so, so I just never followed up on it. I, I, uh, I never had good ventilation anywhere I lived. You have to have good ventilation to paint, you know? And, and so it was always like, well, you know, maybe someday I'll get like an outside studio. Um, but I'm happy to report that the uh, turpentine is way less toxic than it was in my day. And all the, I remember my dad as a joke, my dad uh, in his job got the OSHA newsletter. And so he sent me 
this article from OSHA about how every single oil paint color gave you a different cancer. You know, it was like cadmium yellow, pancreatic cancer. And, uh, and I remember thinking like, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's probably not good. And then, uh, and then in the last 20 years, all these, uh, like abstract expressionists who did, you know, very paint heavy paintings all died very young of all these cancers, you know, early sixties. So, uh, so yeah, maybe it's for the best. I wonder why so many painters have gone mad over the years. Oh, for sure. Just breathing whatever this toxic stuff is. But, you know, maybe it's worth it. Most of them would say, sure, you know, I'll give 20 years of my life to do a good painting or to get the right. Do you think if you asked Van Gogh if it was worth it, he would say yes? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, who knows? He would be very surprised if he, came, you know, was like a... Rip Van Winkle, who came alive and saw, like, oh, they have these interactive, you know, shows that you can, like, experience my sunflowers and, you know, in 3D or whatever. That's such a great, like, ghost world thing, that, that exhibit. I'm in New York. I remember when I was out here, and it was – the exhibit was about five blocks from MoMA. Was it? So you could go – you you know – you've got a day, you know, or maybe you're, um, you know, you're, you're visiting the city and you could do one of two things. You can either go to <laughs> MoMA and see the, you know, some of history's greatest paintings well, or the interactive actual, thing. Yeah. I want to see an actual Max Beckman painting, or I'm going to go to this theme park, like extravaganza, exploiting <laughs> a, a artist who has no, uh, uh, you know, legal heirs. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that a lot of people chose the latter. Uh, I guarantee you infinitely more. What was it that turned? I mean, aside from, you know, having better ven ventilation than before, why did you get back into painting? I'd always, you know, once, as I got older and started going to museums and looking at paintings and, you know, over time you start to go like, oh, I sort of get what they're doing. How did they do that? You know, how how do you think like a painter? And I got very, very interested in that. You know, when I work, I'm working very close. Everything is very precise. You know, it's, it's, uh, you could look at it magnified 50 times and the lines still are very like, solid and linear. Um, but when you look at it, what seems like a very, very, uh, very precise, prissy kind of painting up close, it's all just dabs of color. It's all very loose. And I wanted to, I wanted to understand how that worked. That was my main thing getting into it. And the, my first day, even trying anything, my painting teacher was like, uh, you know, was was saying like that line's too perfect. That's going to look terrible when you back up. And it was true. You back up, and it would just turn into this very ugly. Uh, it, it your eye can't quite like make the the leap, and it it's kind of vibrating almost. And so I would just kind of smudge it up perfect you know so it was, it was very very interesting and i think i brought a little bit of it to some of my drawings comics since then i've done a few illustrations and things where they're much more uh sort of painterly is that the first time in your life that somebody has told you that something is too perfect so it won't work <laughs> uh maybe not but <laughs> it's a weird thing on the face of it it's weird hear. yeah and and at first I didn't know what I thought, you know, that's my thing. I do like, like I'm good with the brush lines, you know, and then I realized like, oh, no, she's absolutely right. And that it's sort of I can see why art, you know, when I'm paint, when I'm inking, I'm holding the brush right on the metal tip right above the brush hairs, you know, total control. And when you're painting, you know, you often hold the brush at the end and you're doing very kind of loose. And I thought, how can that work? But but now I can do it. I find I find after I paint my arm muscles hurt because I'm holding my arm in a totally different way than I'm used to. So it's uh, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, you start to understand why uh, somebody arrives at like a Jackson Pollock level. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a very that's that's a different thing, you know, with dripping paint. Uh, I'm much I'm I'm interested in how how you achieve something that kind of comes alive as a painting because I know how to do it in a comic, but, uh, 
but to you know to have a painting where you're looking at a painting of someone and you go like oh that's a real yep. person that's that's a rare skill because you when you're making a comic you have nothing but context yeah and you i mean just something in the way certain artists believe in their characters and you can feel it and they may be not very skilled at drawing or they may be incredibly skilled but there's something there some spark of life that gives their Frankenstein, it's, it's, you know, it's movement, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. And there's certain artists where you go like, okay, I'm looking at a drawing of a mannequin or of a dead person that's being like manipulated, like a puppet or something. It's, 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 uh, and it, it's not something you can explain to anybody or teach. I think it's, it's all about the belief behind it. When you said that some of these concepts were making their way into your work. Are these in Monica at all? Uh, no, I had not started. I had not started uh, painting before I finished it. So it's, I wasn't really thinking in those terms. So you're working, you're working on stuff right now, then it sounds like. I've done, uh, I've done uh, like a New Yorker cover and a couple other illustrations bigger. So they're more sort of painterly in scope. Um, but I just, I feel myself doing, you know, kind of loose, not necessarily loosening up because the lines are very tight, but, but approaching it in, in a way that's, um, that's, uh, that's less about like the precision at, at a magnified range and more about the way it all comes together across a room. In one of the interviews that I was reading, you alluded to what might be your next project and you use the word experimental and now it's occurring to me that maybe these two things are connected i don't know i don't i, I feel like painting doesn't work for comics at all it's uh there's something about it it's just uh i just feel like i'm looking at little paintings you know it's too too fussy or something so alex ross for example yeah yeah those i mean those look cool because they're because they're good paintings, you know, skilled paintings, but they, I can't even imagine reading them in sequence, you know, it just, it, it kills, kills the magic a little bit. I guess I meant that less literally in that it sounds like oh, one yeah. of the, the big benefits is this is causing you to think about making art in, in a different way and perhaps even changing your relationship to that art. And, you know, I'm wondering if that is going to inform directly on whatever this next project is for sure and and that's that's my intent is to to kind of approach comics from a different you know different viewpoint you know it's mm. i'm trying to like make myself slightly uncomfortable i'm trying to think about different uh you know it, i feel like uh you know, I've had a lifetime of ideas of, of things like that would be an interesting comic. What if somebody did that? And I feel like, um, like it, I, I'd be interested in thinking about those ideas and pursuing something where I, where I explore things that are, are things I haven't tried. There seems to be a lot of that in, in Monica too, just, just in terms of, um, ambition and scope and, and drawing things that you haven't drawn before. Oh yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to hold back on anything, you know, I want, and I, and I didn't want to make anything easy. You know, there's ways to, to tell those kinds of stories where I could have opted for simpler solutions and made them a little easier. And I always, uh, anytime I had a, had a easy medium or hard, uh, choice, I always went with a hard one I, and, and often made it harder than it even had to be because I it was so much more rewarding to to do the thing that uh you know that that felt uh the most challenging when working with so many like disparate threads was there ever a worry that it just might not come together always yeah of course uh but but you know I I have faith um you know I had a sense that everything everything felt right and connected in a way sort of going into it but you have to have the foundation very sturdy going in you can't um you can't just hope to paint yourself in a corner and and somehow leap out of it that that never works so um 
so it had to be like you know the blocks had to be built in a particular sequence for it to all come together but you know you just you have these days where all of a sudden you have three things that didn't quite make sense or add up that all of a sudden just appear just oh here's the answer and then they seem like the most obvious thing in the world you know it really just seems like it was there all the time and i had i just didn't see it and that's you know when those when that starts happening you know you've you've laid the correct foundation पहचान हो 